Welcome to this special guest episode with holistic dentist, Dr. Rebecca Taylor. Dr. Taylor specializes in jaw and airway issues that are connected to conditions like sleep apnea, TMJ issues, and underdevelopment of the face and jaw. In this episode, we dive a little into the research and more about how important the jaw and mouth is for good health. I hope you enjoy. Okay, welcome back to the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show. This is episode 10C, actually, because we've already done two other episodes on this research paper. Uh, I am Dr. Kevin Leach, and I'm here with Dr. Rebecca Taylor. Uh, she will talk to you a little bit about uh, who she is, what she does in a moment here, but the paper we're discussing is called Relationship Between Craniocervical Orientation and Center of Force of Occlusion in Adults, and this is by Curtis Westersund. Jeffrey Shulton and Raymond J. Turner, published in the Journal of Craniomandibular and Sleep Practice. So uh, welcome, Dr. Taylor. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So um, we talked a little bit, you know, just before we started here, you know, about this paper and the importance of it. Why don't you just give me kind of your 50,000 foot overview thoughts on, on this paper and, and how this has to do with what, what it is that you do? Okay, uh, so I mean, basically, what the paper is saying is that, uh, or at least what I got from the paper, is that when you change the cervical spine, it can affect the bite and the occlusion. And when you change the bite and the occlusion, it can affect the cervical spine. Um, there's different, like some cases will be more affected, right? Some patients will be more affected by adjusting the spine or adjusting the bite. Um, but there seems to be a link. And the conclusion was kind of like dentists and chiropractors need to be working together to treat patients because if, if a chiropractor doesn't, doesn't know about the bite or if a dentist doesn't know about the spine and how they, how they play together, then it's really hard to treat some of those patients that really need that integrated model. Yeah. So um, and Just real quick question, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but it's interesting because you say dentists and chiropractors, but I have a feeling that not all dentists are really going to be trained as you've been trained to really understand how to work with a chiropractor or an upper cervical chiropractor. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, TMJ issues and bite issues aren't really taught in dental schools. Um, we get like very little training in it. Um, so, but as you go down that path and you start to learn more about it, which is what I have done, you start to realize that it's not just about the teeth and it's not just about the joint. But in dental school, we don't learn that. Uh, there's so little talk about the cranial bones and C1, C2 and how they're all connected in the jaw and how it opens and closes and the occlusal contacts. Like We just don't really know about that as dentists. And I believe I heard this um, when I was in a TMJ course that like 50 plus years ago, TMJ was actually treated by medical doctors and that was in the medical textbooks. And then it got switched. They're like, no, dentists should be treating this. So then dentists took it on. And then, they, so, but like, there's not really, there's not really a great profession that has really taken on TMJ. So everyone's like, I'll go to my dentist, but like your dentist doesn't really know anything. Like, I can't tell you how many patients I see that have had bite guards that they just bite through, you know, and then they just get another one and they bite through that one, they get another one, they bite through that one. So, um, so it is kind of a specialty, but it's kind of like a, there's not really like a, it's not really a specialty. Like when you're done with dental school, you can't like go to become a TMJ expert, right? right? Like right. an endodontist, you, you could become an endodontist and you could be, uh, you know, an expert in root canals, but like they don't have that for dentistry. Right. So, okay. So that, that's a good lead into how you got involved in doing this and where, where was your segue into saying, Hey, this is important. And I want to, I want to focus on this. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I've been very passionate about, um, airway issues. So, um, snoring, sleep apnea, and ultimately, uh, children like facial development and how that impacts um, how that impacts development of the face. Uh, I'm a holistic dentist so I'm very much like what is the root cause and um, when I, I originally opened my practice and I started to see a lot of adults with dysfunction and they would come to me with snoring and sleep apnea and, and TMJ issues and um, 
And a lot of times in dentistry, we just pull the jaw forward to help open the airway up. And what I recognize doing this is that you're actually causing a lot more TMJ issues. Um, and then I heard, I, so I, I continued my research, you know, in airway, and I actually heard a chiropractor. I heard um, Dr. Chapman speak, and I saw that behind the airway is the spine, the upper cervical spine, and in front of the airway is the tongue, right, which is encompassed by the teeth and the mouth. So I was like, light bulb, like 50%, right? Like, I, I'm only focusing on this part, which is the tongue and the teeth, but there's like this whole other spine thing that's totally impacting the airway. Um, so that's when I started to realize, like, wow, like, we got to make sure that there is a, um, like, an integrative approach with a lot of these patients. Um, I take CT scans on every single patient that I see. It's so important that you do that and have good diagnostic imaging because I can see the rotation of the spine. I can see the airway and how, how everything is rotated, right? And then I can see the wear in the same joint. And so I see this correlation over and over and over. And so when you start to see that, you're like, wow, we've got to work together. Like we can't just have dentistry over here and chiropractic over here. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't work well. Um, you can you can do a lot of good for people without the chiropractic piece, but you will have a handful of patients that your treatment's not going to work as well. You know, absolutely, and so. I can and I I can relate to that uh, in the other way around. Is when I mm -hmm. see problems with the cervical spine and misalignment and you know reverse curve in the neck and. I treat them and I have some patients that I know need to come and see you because a big part of what's going on with their health is that myofacial development airway kind of thing. And what I'm doing for them while it's good, it's only getting them so far. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, in a perfect world, if everybody had enough, you know, time and resources, they be, everybody would, <laughs> would see both. And uh, to get everything to get everything corrected, right? Yeah. Um, so just in a, in, a, in a quick question, where where did where are you learning, and where did you learn? I know you do a ton of of continuing education because mm -hmm. you're so passionate about what what it is that you do. Where did you get your foundation, and and how to treat, and and how to do all of this stuff? Oh man, all over. All um, over. Yeah. I started at LVI, so learning neuromuscular dentistry. Um, which was great, but uh, at that time, they weren't focusing a lot on the airway. Um, then I did training with Dr. David Singh, who is all about the airway and about facial growth and development and the maxilla specifically, like developing the maxilla. Um, and so then I did more training with um, Dr. Jay Gerber, who used to teach at LVI, so I did his program. I took some program, uh, some uh, classes with uh, Mariano Roccabato, who is a physical therapist that treats a lot of TMJ and works with dentists, so I learned his techniques. Um, and then I started learning more and more about child facial development and, and airway, you know, and started treating a lot of kids with sleep apnea, um, and, and what I've really kind of come to, to realize is that, you know, the airway is your lifeline. Like you can live days without food and water, you but very if you long stop breathing. breathing. <laughs> exactly. So like the body will do amazing things to keep that airway open. And when, we, when your body's doing things to keep the airway open, it can cause dysfunction. Absolutely. It's an and adaptation, so we, right? Yeah. yeah, we're constantly adapting. We're constantly, you know, using different muscles that we wouldn't normally use for certain things. And that's going to pull things out of alignment. And so, so I've really taken away from all of my education, like the airway is the king. Nice. And we got to support that. Nice. And usually when you see dysfunction somewhere else, a lot of times it's because they're not breathing right. Right. You know, so. that's, it's, that's a huge, I'd love at some point to be able to do some research uh, into, um, you know, into, it's like the chicken or the egg, right? It's like, mm -hmm. okay, you know, in my line of work, there's an upper cervical misalignment that could change posture, could change occlusion, that could change a ton of stuff. And then same thing, if we don't have proper myofascial development, that's going to change the spine, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like mm -hmm. chicken or it's, the egg. Let's do some they're, research. Yes. They're so in, they're so intertwined. And um, yeah, at least, well, 
Go ahead. I think that, I mean, like, so Dr. Chapman has uh, CT scans of patients before he adjusts them and after. And I think he's doing that research right now on like just the cervical spine. How does that change the volume of the airway? Um, so he's working on it and he, and I've seen some of his stuff. It's amazing how much that adjustment in the upper cervical spine affects the airway. But when the muscles and everything are not functioning the right way, then you'll, you're going to pull them right back to old habits, right? Yeah. That's where the, the functional stuff comes in and the muscle work comes in. Um, but it's also interesting if you look at like birth trauma um, and you look at, you know, was the baby C-section or natural birth or was the baby on its stomach or was it in a little jumpy thing, right? Like that's going to alter the pelvis and that can have, you know, there can be ascending or descending thing that's, that happen, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of babies too are tongue-tied. And when the patient... When the baby is tongue tied, they're not able to nurse properly. And that tongue that's moving on that palate is actually helping spread the palate and develop the facial bones. Right. So like, it's kind of all related together. And I, I think that, you know, one of the best things that babies can have done is chiropractic, right? Making sure that everything is aligned properly. That's going to help set them up for proper development. Also making sure that the tongue is not tied, make sure they can breastfeed properly. So the tongue can widen the maxilla. So the mandible can then grow forward out of the airway space, you know, um, and that's ultimately going to help support the upper cervical spine and all of the spine. Yeah. So I yeah. think it really, in a perfect world, we'd be, we, we know how to prevent this and treat this early. And fortunately, people don't recognize it's an issue until there's pain or snoring yeah. or ADHD or, yeah. you know, a lack of growth. Yeah. And I, I, I believe you could relate to our profession in the sense that, Whenever, when I, when I, when I found the word insidious to relate to the misalignment of the upper cervical spine, I was like, that is perfect because it's something that negatively affects you slowly mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. time, right? And it's yes. the same thing. Like people can have a misalignment in their upper neck, live their entire life without mm -hmm. ever getting adjusted, but would they have been better off if they got adjusted? obviously. So it's not going to kill them in most mm -hmm. cases. Same thing with what mm -hmm. it is that you do. Could they live the rest of their life and, and, and still live? Yes. But are they going to be a heck of a lot better off if they had proper development, proper mm -hmm. myofascial development, and a proper airway, et cetera, and have less issues to deal with in life? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, but I would actually say that uh, a lot of people die from sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. So it actually is life-threatening. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people don't just die when they're 40 in their sleep, like that with no other comorbidities. Like right. that doesn't right. make sense. Right. It is so, so undiagnosed. Yeah. Um, when I went to LVI, they, they were saying that 80% of sleep apnea cases are still undiagnosed. Huh. So because like, they're asymptomatic. As yeah, far they, as, just, right. they just don't know. Well, one, like we think snoring is normal, yeah. right? Like if you are sleeping next to somebody and they're snoring, that is not normal. Not normal. If you're on an airplane and you see somebody sleeping with their mouth open, like that is not normal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna screenshot that. Screen that, that can right? be the. That can, <laughs> you really want to hear this girl? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's not normal. So like we as a society don't really talk about yeah, that yeah. as being an issue. Yeah. Um, and I do sleep studies on. I would say like I screen everybody for airway issues, and everybody has some kind of clinical red flag, right? So I do a ton of sleep studies on patients. I have a take home thing, a sleep doctor works with them, but I screen everybody. Probably 80 to 90% of people have some kind of mild, at least mild airway issue. Yeah. Um, some of the new research coming out is showing that clenching and grinding is actually a symptom of sleep disorder breathing. So Makes if sense. you clench and you grind, if yeah. you've got popping teeth, like those are all signs that you could potentially have an airway issue but like there's just a lack of education in our society Absolutely. uh also kids that have adhd right like they can't focus in school what happens when you don't get good sleep like as an adult you're gonna feel irritable right and you're gonna feel tired as a kid you're gonna feel hyperactive yeah. and you're gonna act out so mm -hmm. i've seen a lot of kids too that their their behavior completely changes in school once they address the airway but again we don't, we're not talking about that, right? Yeah. Like we don't, we're not necessarily as a, as a society, like saying, oh, well go have the airway checked. We're saying, oh, go get them on meds. 
right? Yeah. So there's just like a disconnect. Um, yeah, for sure. So. Um, so what can people do? I, I, I know you said there's probably 80 to 90% of people probably have some sort of issue. So most people could get checked. It's mm -hmm. the same thing with the upper cervical spine. Like find me mm -hmm. someone who hasn't had an accident or fallen mm -hmm. out of a tree. You know, like it's yeah. most people have this issue. Yes. Do you have, do you have like a self screening process that someone watching this might be able to do to say, wow, this is actually, I, I'm instead of just, oh yeah, I probably have it, but I don't mm -hmm. see any symptoms and I sleep fine mm -hmm. or whatever. What are some things that people can look for to say, Hey, wow, this may be significantly affecting me and I should really go see mm -hmm. about you or a functional dentist. Okay. So kids and adults kind of have different symptoms, uh, with a kid. Um, if there's any snoring with a kid, that is a problem. Um, if kids wake up and they're really fussy a lot, like really, really fussy, have a hard time keeping food down. Like if they have, you know, if they're constantly, um, like throwing food up, that's an issue. Mm -hmm. Um, any kind of ADHD types of symptoms, like not being able to focus a lack of growth. So inability to thrive, that would also be one. Um, and in adults, what we see mostly is snoring again as an issue. If you note, if your bed partner notices that you stop breathing mm. at nighttime, uh, I, I hear this all the time, like, yeah, they'll just stop breathing. And then I'm like, are you gonna, are you, <laughs> you know, like I nudge them and they wake up and start breathing again. Um, the other one would be, where's your tongue rest? Is your tongue up in your palate or does your tongue rest in the floor of your mouth? Mm. If the tongue rests in the floor of the mouth, then it's going to pull back into the airway and cause more issues. It means that the muscle has not been developed enough. So that would be another thing. Um, are you a mouth breather? This is for adults and kids. Do you breathe through your nose or do you breathe through your mouth? When you're sleeping, do you breathe through your nose or do you breathe through your mouth? Um, if you breathe through your mouth, that's an issue. That's not normal. Um, waking up really tired also can be another really big red flag symptom. Like I'm just, I sleep 10 hours and I'm not, I'm not well rested. Right. So, you know, I remember back in undergrad, I don't know, I don't think he was my roommate, but it, it was a guy I went to school with and I was, I don't know, I must've been 20, 21. And he had stayed over, or he was in the same room that night or whatever. And he had, he must've had sleep apnea. I remember, I can't, I don't remember if he stopped breathing and I noticed it cause I must've been sleeping. But when he, when he took the breath in, mm -hmm. I legitimately thought he was dying. The sound, yeah. the sound that was coming out of his, you know, gasping for mm -hmm. the air. Mm -hmm. I was legitimately scared. Like, should I, like, he's still sleeping. Should I wake mm -hmm. him up? Is he, is he okay? And then late the next day I told him about it and he was like, yeah, I have sleep apnea or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it's embedded in my brain. Like it was so dramatic. I was like, yeah. this, is, this is crazy. So what happens um, is if that doesn't get treated, what happens when you don't breathe and you're sleeping or, or when you're awake, what happens is your brain goes, um, I need some oxygen. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Where's my oxygen. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. it's like, can you breathe? And there's a, like, usually there's a physical obstruction. So like the tongue is in the airway and you right. can't breathe. Right. And so the brain's like, okay, I need oxygen. And it's like, I'm trying, but I can't. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is the heart then, because the heart pumps the blood, the heart is like, Whoa, we got to get more oxygen to that brain. So then the heart speeds up, uh, yeah. right? And so this is why a lot of people that have sleep apnea that's undiagnosed, they die from a heart attack in their sleep. When you're mm. sleeping, your blood pressure should go down, right. not up, right. right? And your body should be in, the, in detox mode. It should be healing. Your hormones should be kind of resetting when you're sleeping. But that doesn't happen with people with sleep apnea yeah. because it's this fight or flight sympathetic nervous system response that's on all night long because your body is trying to keep you alive. So all sorts of systems break down. Uh, so another one of the red flags would be like, are you on blood pressure meds? Have you had to be on a couple because they don't work well for you, right? So like we see a lot of, a lot of blood pressure issues. And in fact, when you treat the airway, a lot of times you don't have to be on the blood pressure meds anymore. The doctors take them off of them mm, because nice. like I saw this with my partner, Patrick, like he was on blood pressure meds. We treated his snoring, his airway. I young. know he's, Gee. he's been on blood pressure meds since he was, 
in his 20s, mm. early 20s. They were like, we don't know what's wrong with you. Man. And then he's like, oh, I snore. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to fix that. Yeah. <laughs> so I fixed it. Now he doesn't snore. Awesome. But now his blood pressure, he, we took his blood pressure and it yeah. was like 100 over 60. We're like, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so low. Yeah. So he went to his doctor and they're like, okay, well, let's take, take off. off the medication. Yeah. And now he's normal, you know, yeah. no more blood pressure. Awesome. So like, it's, you know, and, and being a dentist, like a lot of times, you know, people are like, well, you're just a dentist. You know, how, how would you know about the blood pressure? But what I'm telling you is like, there's such a link like we are one body right like the upper cervical spine really is connected to yeah. the rest of the body same with the teeth the mouth the airway all of that right so like it's kind of naive that we have like all of these different it's i understand it but like we all need to work together on these patients yeah. because like we can have huge impact on overall health yeah well know? it's what what i'm excited about is papers like this that are because mm -hmm. if if academia and if the public don't know about this, like we're kind of these, the pioneers in this, because mm -hmm. when we talk, if we talk to somebody about this conversation or the average person sees this, they're going to say, what are you talking about? Like they're not even, you know, they're yeah. not even, they're not even close. Um, but it's like, this is the kind of stuff that excites me because this is, it makes so much sense mm -hmm. and it's really paving the way for more people to get help and for more providers to start working together as you know as they should and, and yeah. triage to each other and, and, and maybe it'll out. change our education right because like if you're never exposed to this type of stuff when you're in school then you're not going to be super open to it right you Absolutely. know Absolutely. and you'll and you might even put it down because you just don't know yeah so um and and patients also like i have some patients that i'm like i need you to go see a chiropractor and do all of this before I see you. And they're like, do I really need to do that? And I'm like, yes, I will not see you unless you do it. Yeah. And then they go somewhere else. They don't do it. Yep. Happens all the time. I know. And then they're worse off. And then they come back to me yeah. Yeah. and I'm yeah. like, well, you decide to go somewhere else. So it's like, you know, if, and, so if patients, uh, like if that was the new standard yeah. and it was the new model, like, right. oh my gosh, it would, well, it would help people so much. It's the same. I, 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 it's the same thing with me. It's like people come to me and they're like, Hey, I got this problem. And I'm like, Hey, I could, you know, most likely help. Here's how we're going to do it. And they look at me and they're like, I haven't heard of this my entire life. Why mm -hmm. should I believe this or trust this? And I'm like, I'm sorry. You've never been told. Like, I'm sorry that yes. this isn't common, but this is, this is healthcare, and this is the way it should be. It's sad, but you know, hopefully, just more and more, you know, this information will get out, and I think it will. With the, you know, with still with the availability of information on the internet, you know, good and bad, but people can hopefully sift through that and start to think like that yeah. makes sense. Well, and know? I think like we are kind of sick of being sick. A lot of people, really? they want answers, right? They're like, why am I on all these pills? Like, why can't we fix this? Like, you know, and so I think more and more people are turning to like the internet and turning to places to look and like, and unfortunately some people do a little too much research online and they have like Google degrees, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And they come to you and they're like, no, you need to do it like this. And you're like, hey, I'll let me do my job. Like, yeah. trust me, I yeah. know what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, I do think that in, in this country, like our health system is kind of broken. And a lot of us with our food and our lifestyle choices, like we're not getting better. You know, our kids these days are sick. Yep. I see so many sick kids, so many kids with tonsils and adenoids that are just in yep. flames. So many kids that are mouth breathing, right? So much yep. ADHD, more autism, like all of these things. And like, what is going on? So I think like, and it's so multifactorial, like I don't believe it's just one thing. Of course, of course. Like, you know, and everyone likes to blame one thing. It's not, it's like everything together. But like, we, I think as a society are kind of getting like sick of being sick. Absolutely. And so we're starting to look for more things, especially in the West Coast, right? On the West Coast, like we're more like open to that type of thing. Right. Um, and like, it's so funny because, you know, most, most doctors, like they don't talk to their patients about nutrition. You know, if you have a patient that's high cholesterol, they're like, don't eat eggs, you know, and it's like the eggs are not the issue. Yeah, I know. Oh man. Right? I, know. I know. 
I know. So um, I think it's just, it's a lack of education. And yeah. I feel so strongly that we really need to like educate all healthcare practitioners to be more integrated, yeah. you know, and to have Absolutely. more of a functional approach. Like you can have like the CPAP machine, like there's nothing wrong with a CPAP machine to treat sleep apnea. But if you don't offer patients all of their options, Absolutely. you're not really doing them a service because the CPAP more. is not going to correct the problem. Right. Right. right? Yep. So, Absolutely. yeah. So um, let's give the listeners, uh, if you would, maybe new parents out there. They see mm -hmm. this and they're like, huh, like, okay, I want my kids, you know, as the twig is bent, so mm -hmm. shall the tree grow, right? So right. what can we, what can you on your side say, okay, here's a, here's a, couple, a couple things, a little checklist of things that they should do that they can do themselves mm -hmm. as parents to mm -hmm. encourage and help their, you know, their airway and their, their myofascial development and all like, mm -hmm. what can they do a good checklist to make sure that they are going to have a good chance of developing normally? Uh, so one, it starts really before your baby's even born, like having good nutrition, nutrition yeah. uh, follow Weston Price's mm -hmm. guidance for nutrition. Right. Uh, we're so deficient in different nutrients because of the way that our food is, uh, grown and our soils are depleted. So like everybody probably when they're pregnant needs some kind of supplementation. So it starts there. Um, and then after that, like babies need to be breastfed. A lot of times there's difficulty breastfeeding or they'll tell mom like, well, you don't have enough milk and it's really painful. And usually what that means is that the baby has a functional issue like a tongue tie or a buckle tie. Mm. And um, like, I, again, I've seen ba like newborn babies that have had issues breastfeeding and they've gone to five different lactation consultants. All of them have said, this baby is fine. There's nothing functionally wrong. And the mom is over here going, I cannot do this. Like I am literally dying over here. And then they go to a, a dentist that does a tongue tie release and now the baby can automatically breastfeed. And so, and you just see this time and time again. So like, get multiple opinions. Like when, if there's an issue breastfeeding, don't give up on an issue. Like, you know, don't give up. Huge. There's, there's a really great uh, clinic in Bellevue actually called Health Latch hmm. that deals with newborn babies up to four months old. And they're awesome because they are so trained in looking and, and identifying tongue tie. Again, it's like so underdiagnosed. So like breastfeeding really sets up a kid, not only with their immune system, but also for facial development because it gets the palate expanded. Bottles and pacifiers, that pushes the tongue down and then the palate collapses. So you're more likely to have so congestion no bottles, in no the pacifiers. airway. No bottles, no pacifiers. I mean, that's a tough thing to ask because the pacifier is like the babysitter, right? right but right. if you can avoid as much of that as possible, that's good. Also having your babies use big spoons because you want them stretching their mouth open. It's gonna promote development. Um, at six months, they can start to eat hard things. So like, if you think about back in the day, we didn't have blenders, right? We'd have blenders to make like mushed up stuff. Right. So like our mouths are actually not growing because we're not chewing and that chewing and that stimulation in the jaw joint really is impacting the development of the palate. And then when you have this underdevelopment here, everything gets, gets squished and then the spine go straight, right? It's like reverse curve because like airways trying to stay open. So uh -huh. food, get them chewing, have them gnawing on things. Like do kids these any, days. Do you have any specific recommendations? Three things that, you know, when they start to eat uh, whole, you know, whole foods, what can they mm -hmm. start? What, what, are the, what are the best things to get them to start chewing that they'll actually eat? So there's a really good book called Baby Led Weaning. And it's a whole book on how to get kids chewing and off you know from breastfeeding to chewing and getting the jaw and the muscles going um i like like you know just give them a big bone right like a big chicken leg or something or a chicken whatever and have them just gnaw on it right yeah. like yeah. just get them chewing yeah. it doesn't even have to be food right uh, just get yeah. them chewing on things yeah. um so that would be definitely recommended for like babies um and kids if you see that your kid is sitting with their, their mouth open you got to get their tonsils and adenoids checked. Mm. If they have swollen tonsils and adenoids and they're not breathing properly, this entire maxilla going to collapse, everything going to go back, upper cervical spine will be 
affected, right? Yeah, so yeah. you got to get them breathing through their nose. Hmm. I'm not a huge fan of removing tonsils and adenoids because I believe that tonsils and adenoids that are inflamed are a sign of something else going on, right. uh, but you have to address them. So whether you address them with a functional medicine doctor or a naturopath or an ENT who removes them, like I don't really care, but we have to get the, the nasal breathing established um, and the mouth closed. Yeah. Also, sometimes kids are tongue-tied because it's missed as a baby, right? See this too, where like kids uh, could only breast them for two, feed them for two months. It was painful, so they went to bottle. And then now they are, they've got their mouth open all the time. Yeah. And maybe they're tongue-tied and that's what's pulling the jaw down. So if your kid is mouth breathing, that we need to look deeper into that. Uh, a good test you can do with your child is like put a piece of tape over their mouth and see if they can breathe through their nose for two minutes. If they can do that, yeah. then usually we can work with them to retrain it and it may be more of a habit, mm. right? Because mm. kids, are, we don't really teach kids how to breathe. We're not like, hey, nose is for breathing, mouth right. is for eating and yeah. smiling, right? Yeah. We're, like, we're like, oh, my kid's so cute. Look at him, he's, you know. But right. then he grows up into an adult that looks like Napoleon Dynamite and you're like, <laughs> so well, you so can, that, that, you know, that begs the question of, okay, well, I don't think, I don't think as children in our development, even before our time, that they would actually, you shouldn't have to teach them how because we should be developing naturally, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in the transition to, you know, back in the day when they didn't have blenders and they did have mm -hmm. to chew, right? Those things would develop and they're eating things, they're eating off the land and they're not inflamed mm -hmm. and have allergies or yeah. sensitivities to different foods. Like that's all going to happen naturally, right? Absolutely. So I would say for, for parents as well, it's like do everything as natural as possible. Things that, you know, whether it's, you know, the paleo diet or something similar to like real whole foods. Getting and get that. testing. Like I, again, like I eat super well. Like I have eaten extremely well, like pretty much my whole life. I have blood work done like every six months. And I like, I just had it done recently. I'm like, I eat like a, a couple jars of sardines every week and my omega threes are low. And my iodine is low. Yeah. Like what is going on? Right. So like, that's why you like, you have to test, right. you know, you have to know like, what is your vitamin D at? Oh, I take it every day. Okay. But what is that? What is the level? Like right. if I don't know the level, then I can't really advise you as to what to take. So yeah, like a, a good healthy diet is super important. At least a great foundation, but like do some testing too, because you might not be absorbing all of that. Right. right. You might not be getting all of that into your body. And like, a piece of kale today is different than a piece of kale 50 years ago because our soils are depleted. Right. So, you know, you can eat salad all day long, but if the salad doesn't have the nutrients in it, then you're not really getting that into your body. So there's so many different places where there can be a breakdown, you know, and that's where like working with a doctor who can help hold your hand during that is, is important. Right. right. Um, but yeah, like just eating a more whole food diet. I really like Weston Price's book. You know, he was a dentist that went around in the 1930s and he looked at all these populations that hadn't had any kind of like processed food introduced or, you know, they were living off of the land yeah. and he found that none of them needed orthodontics. Like they had these huge wide palates. They had no health issues. Like, you know, women would have 14 babies and all of their teeth would be completely rock hard solid. Um, and he found that it didn't matter if they were in Alaska or the Philippines or Switzerland, they're all eating different diets, but he found that the fat soluble vitamins were really important in, you know, um, oral health. And, um, what's that would, book called again? Um, just for the listeners, I can link it's to Weston, it. It's by Weston Price and it's called, um, Nutritional Degeneration. Got it. And it's a fabulous book. He took thousands of pictures. And the interesting thing is that he would go to neighboring towns where like the same people from this village went and in just one generation on processed foods like sugar and white flour crowded, like their mouths were crowded mm. Mm. and they needed orthodontic treatment bad. And they were like, they had like such a, he saw such a decline in their health in just one generation. So it's okay. fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. How much absolutely. food matters. All right. Um, well, so is there anything else, any other points or anything that you want to, that you want to share in regards to, you know, just 
the development or the the relationship uh, or, or anything? Is there anything that you that you feel is important that people should know? Um, I mean, just the tongue position and the breathing through the nose. Those two things are like the most important. Got it. Awesome. So, and not everybody knows how to identify them. And a lot of like ENTs even, you know, they're like, oh, the tonsils are big, it's fine, you'll grow out of that. But when you're developing as a kid, you know, you're like 90% developed by age eight. Mm. So like, do it now, like don't wait right. for them to grow out of it. Because right. actually during that early development, that's the time to treat it and right. to correct it. Because mm -hmm. if you wait until your kid is 11 or 12, yes, I can still help and work with that, but it is so much easier Agreed. to do it early. Agreed. You know? Same with the spine. You know, people yeah. who grow up and they have a scoliosis, it could actually be from the spine or the airway to get it treated as soon as possible. Absolutely. So that they can grow normally. I mean, I, I know that, that I have that going on in my spine. I've got asymmetries mm -hmm. in my in my spine that I know mm -hmm. could have been helped with my health history, you know, and yeah. what's been going on with it. So Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Like yeah. part of why I got into this is because, you know, I've had orthodontics twice and I have popping and TMJ issues and I've got, you know, a small airway and I'm like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have these issues, you know. And my mom was a dentist. I didn't want to bring that up, but like, come on, mom. <laughs> But yeah. the thing is, but again, it's a lack of education, yeah, she didn't you know? know? Yeah, so just getting it out to like practitioners and like the community and the public, like we have, we've got to get this out. You know, I've got so many kids now. I'm like, man, if that would have been me, if I, I would have been treating me, I, know. I would be in a very different position I with my know. own health now. I know. The kids that come into the practice, I'm just like, you don't understand how so lucky. lucky you are. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, um, so I'm going to link, uh, I'll put in the description below the video on YouTube, your practice information, website, phone number, Great. all of that stuff. Is there anything else that you want me to link to, to people to get a hold of you or information or anything that you would like? Our, our Facebook page has a lot of okay. great uh, we post a lot of great stuff on that. Also, um, my hygienist, Barbara, uh, she writes a blog called The Queen of Dental Hygiene. She great. has a lot of great stuff on airway and tongue ties and, you know, all awesome. of that good stuff. Um, so, yeah. And then, and then our own website has a lot of great stuff, too. So, Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I'll link to all that so people can get in touch with you for consultation, information, et cetera. Awesome. Awesome. Dr. Tyler, thank you so much for doing this. I hope this was valuable for everybody. I'm sure it will be, and uh, we'll get it posted and try to spread it and uh, get people educated. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Right. Okay. That's it for this episode. So what did you learn that fascinated you or surprised you about the research today? Join or start the conversation in the comments below. Hey, thanks so much for watching. To watch more of our research shows, click or tap the screen right there. To subscribe to the channel, click or tap the screen right there. Until next time, I'm Dr. Kevin Leach with the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show, bringing awareness to conservative primary spine care, upper cervical chiropractic care, and traditional chiropractic. Until next time, take care and take care of your spine. It's the only one you'll ever have.